Give somebody a high five if you're ready to worship. Amen. Air five up here. I was asked this morning by uh, Brother Ricky, one of the deacons. He, he asked me this. I've never been asked this before. He said, where did you meet Jesus this week? And I thought about that for a couple of seconds. I said, well, I met him a lot of different places. And so I think that rings true this morning that, man, he, he, he is with us yeah. wherever we go. Yeah. I'm thankful for Ricky asking me that this morning. It was an encouraging reminder that he never leaves me nor forsakes me. The same for you, that he goes with you wherever you go throughout this week. And the cool thing about this, too, we get to meet him this morning and worship. Yeah. Amen. I 
stronger than the curse. Greater are you who's in me than he who's in the world. The words you have spoken are stronger than the curse. Greater are you who's in me than he who's in the world. The words you have spoken are stronger. Proclaim it this morning. The words you have spoken. Greater are you in. Come on, proclaim it over your life this morning. The words you have spoken are stronger than the curse. Greater are you in. Spoken are stronger than the curse. Greater are you in than he who's in the world. The words you have spoken. Change who I am, I belong to you. You know the enemy can no take what I have. Oh, and change who I am, I belong to you. Cause I belong to you. I belong. can take from me my destiny cause I belong to you thank you Lord thank you Jesus
church.
this morning church he will not fail you God will not fail you you can trust in that you can take that to the bank he will not fail you God is faithful amen faithful we draw our strength from him we're encouraged because he is faithful to us do not worry about tomorrow he will take care of that Sometimes we worry about those things. We let little trivia things bother us, but do not worry about tomorrow. He says, I will supply every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. Stand firm, church. Stand firm. Stand firm in your faith. Stand firm in the faith. We're going to worship the Lord in giving this morning. I pray that you've got your tithes and offerings ready to present to him to worship Him and give Him thanks. Amen. He's faithful. If you was to lose your job today, He will supply another one. He will supply another job. That's just the God that we serve. He loves you. He has it all planned out. We just got to trust Him. Amen. We got to trust Him and walk in that faith. Walk strong in that faith. He will not fail. Father, we lift you up this morning. We're glad to be in your house of prayer today. We're excited today, God, for your presence is here, what you're doing in our lives, and the word that's fixing to come to us, God, the worship that we sing to you. What a, what a powerful message. You will not fail. You will not fail. We trust in that. We live in that, God. We pray your blessings upon each one here this morning. Those that are sick, that are not able to be with us, God, we pray over them that your touch would heal them. And God, we give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. October 31st at 5.30 p.m. at Feeding America. Come out, fellowship, and help our community um, at 300 Press Peterson. I really need my glasses. 300 Peterson Drive, Elizabethtown. October the 28th, WOW Gathering. Yeah. <clears throat> That's from noon to 2 p.m. Come gather with our women. Join us for food the word, and a great time of prayer and worship. And then one of my favorites, of course, November 5th, corporate prayer, 5 p.m. Come worship corporately as one body. And now we're going to get to do something that all families love to do, and that is meet and greet. Amen?
Amen. Is this thing on? No, yes. Oh, I hear it now. Like echoes in my head. It's who am I to not worship you, God of the universe? That's the question today, isn't it? Who am I? Who am I? I think often about that uh, chapter in Job. When Job's done complaining, the Lord says, brace yourself as a man because I have a few questions for you. You ask me who am I, but I ask you, who are you? So who are, who are we not to worship him this morning? I might get a little sidetracked, and I do apologize. I woke up this morning to a dream at about 3.30 this morning. I had a dream, and it was just a weird dream. You know, I dreamed that I retired. <laughs> That's what it was. It was, a, it was a dream when I retired, and I woke up out of my bed, and I looked at my watch, and it said October 22nd. And I said, huh, three years ago, Jessica and I were in Hawaii, and I just retired from the Marine Corps. And I just kind of thought about that for a minute. I thought, wow, three years, three years, man, where did three years go? Holy smokes. And then I started thinking about back to uh, uh, 2011 and how the Lord just started moving in my life. You see, because I wasn't supposed to be here in Elizabethtown never was supposed to come. That was not my plan. You know, my plan was to uh, live in Louisville. I had just received orders uh, to become the uh, recruiter instructor for, uh, or assistant recruiter instructor for uh, recruiting substation, or recruiting station Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, I was all pumped up, and the guy I was going to go work for, he was like, man, I can't wait for you to come. I can't wait for you to get here. You know, we're really excited about you being on the training team. We're really excited about you coming up here. And I said, well, I'm excited about it. And at the time, Jessica and I were living in Evansville, Indiana. Which, if you ever lived in Evansville, Indiana, it's Evansville, Indiana, right? <laughs> try, try going from California to Evansville. <laughs> that, was a, that, was a, that was a wake up. And when we got there, uh, anyway, so uh, Jessica and I were starting to make plans. And Jesse said, well, you know, I have a career here, so since you're going to be on the road a lot, I'm going to stay here, and you move to Louisville, and we'll get your own apartment or whatever the case may be, and we'll go from there. Okay. Some military families do that. Sometimes we have to do that. We have to just make do with whatever is happening in our way, and that's, that's one thing that I can say about my wife, who I miss today. My best friend's not here. She's, she's at home, but... I know in Jesus' name, by the time I get home, she's going to be healed. So, we had a plan. The boys were in school. They didn't want to move. Uh, Cody was starting high school. He was playing football. He didn't want to move. He was tired of the whole, you know, every year and a half, two years, let's go. Kind of like being a pastor, from what I understand, right? I was being prepared way before I even knew it. So, I, anyway, I'll get to the get this story here. I was in my office and my boss shows up, Scott Steffen, and he uh, looks at me and he says, uh, hey Gunny, I'm here today to tell you I changed your orders. And this is where you're going, this is what you're going to do. Any questions? <laughs> no sir. Instant obedience orders, right? And he left and I was mad. I was mad because he had moved me out of that position that he was going to send me to to another position. I was mad because he took me out of the fight. I was mad because he put me in a different aspect. I was mad because he threw me in an operations billet. But little did I know that God had a plan. So several years ago, Jessica told me, she said, we should really start telling people about how God used them in our lives. So I came here and, and uh, you know, my, my cousin, who I hadn't spoke to and Ten years. Calls me up and he says, hey man, I got a room for you. You come stay here in Elizabethtown until you and Jessica find a home. Okay, hey, great, man. So I'm, I'm commuting back and forth from E-Town to uh, Louisville for, for quite some time until Jessica comes. And then we find out that we actually, Jessica has family here in Elizabethtown. Who would have knew, right? Everyone's from Kentucky. Adam and Eve started in Kentucky. You now I'm telling you. So we, so we come here, and we, we go, and we, we go out to the family reunion, and we meet Wayne Borders. And Wayne says, blah, 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 we start talking to him. He goes, well, I have a house for you. 
awesome. So the next thing I know, I have a house. We have a house, we, we, a cheap, you know, cheap rent, and everything was working. It was right over here in Indian Hills, and we were, we were like, wow, three bedrooms. This is more than we needed, right? Uh, so we move in, and then uh, J- and I look at Jessica, and I said, well, we should find a church. And she's like, what? My husband said, what? So she says, well, I'll go look for one. Well, she knew that I grew up in Cleveland, Tennessee, so she kind of had a feeling how I felt about certain denominations. <laughs> so she said, well, we better not go to that one down the road. I'm talking about here. So she's looking, she's going through the, the thing, she's texting her mom and dad, getting referrals of, you know, where we're going to go, what we're going to do. And I just came home from work and I said, well, what about the one right down the road? I said, it's closer. I picked it out of convenience, but the Lord had already chosen it. Isn't that amazing? And when I look back at all that situation and everything that's taking place in our house, our, 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 our lives, our house, I, I am just, I just stand in amazement in his work. And every now and again, he, he, he makes me hit pause just to kind of sit and think about what I've done in your life. Son, listen to me. Let me tell you what I've done in your life. See, you can rewind all the way back to 2003 when I requested orders to become a drill instructor. All my buddies thought, guess what? He's headed that way. That's him. That's where he needs to go. So I was training, 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 getting ready for drill instructor school. Every single person I went to, man, you're, boom, stamp the proof, stamp the proof, stamp the proof. That's where you're going. That's where you're going. So I get into the uh, sergeant major's office. And he says, Sergeant Jones, you ready to go to recruiting school? And I said, what? Recruiting school? What is that? That is not my plan, Sergeant Major. He said, well, it's the Marine Corps' plan. So what did I say? Okay, (laughs) because you're not allowed to say, well, I don't know about all that. But then how did he set me up for that? And then I look at all that stuff, all that stuff, and I look back. And when I first retired, Jessica and I built my resume. And when I was looking at that resume, I had no, I, I just laughed. I just started laughing. I said, look how God moved. Look what he did. He took me from what I thought I was and made me who I am without me even knowing about it. So he had a plan from the very beginning. And then when, you come, when I came here and I looked around this morning, or actually when I was at home and I was just kind of thinking about how this place used to look, I think we had green carpet. Is that right? Was it red? Thank you. Okay. We had pews. I remember that. I remember me and Pastor Jerry talking about pews because he said, Fred, they're going to run me out of here. <laughs> and I said, well, that's okay. We'll just get some lawn chairs and sit in the front lawn. It'll be all right. And then we tore out the stage. Stage got larger. We got rid of the TVs. You remember the old TVs that were up here? Now we have this big, beautiful screen behind us. And then Chris said the light show wasn't good, so he, looked up, he hooked up a laser light show in here, Right? Then we built a school, I'm fast forwarding quite a bit, we built a school, we built classrooms, we're moved around here, man, just a lot of change has happened, a lot of change, a lot of people's come, a lot of people's go, it's a lot of change, this guy putting people in the right positions to do the right place, you know, he's setting up the kingdom, he's setting up the kingdom, a lot's changed, but one thing still remains the same, what's that? God, his word. His word remains the same. It will not return void, Wendy. It won't. It won't return void. So last week I was talking about three words. Do we remember? Are you ready? Are you ready? ready? Heard that my whole life, everywhere I went. Are you ready? I always brace for impact every time. I hope the slide's up. I don't know, is it? Just keep going. Click, click, click. We'll get there eventually. Don't pay attention to any of that stuff up there. We'll get there eventually, okay? Like I told the class on Tuesday and Thursday night, sometimes I forget to click, click, <laughs> and I just start rolling. I learned that from Pastor Jerry. He'd be talking, and I'm in the classroom going, what's he talking about? It's not on the board. And then I realized that I better what? Just listen. Just shut up and listen and quit paying attention to the the, uh, the, the screen. Keep going. Go, go, go. Yeah, getting there, I think. Yeah, that'd be good. We'll go from there. 
I pulled Doug Spain out. Yeah, that'll be all right. <laughs> so we need to be ready because there's not going to be time to what? To get ready. You know, pay attention to what's going on around you. Pay attention. Pay attention. If you're not paying attention right now, I don't know what else is going to, what's going to get your, your attention, right? And Jesus will come like a thief in the night. He's going to come. Whether you believe it or not, he's going to come. Your life's going to end. I don't know if you know this or not, but you're not going to make it out of this life alive. Every single person in this room will pass away. I will pass away, every single body. We don't know the time nor the place. And as General Stonewall Jackson used to tell us, they used to say, hey, General Jackson, why are you so calm? He says, because my God teaches me just to be as calm in my bed as I'm on the battlefield. He wasn't concerned about his time or place. That would already been determined by the Lord our God. So why should he worry about that? I thought about that often when I read books about him. What an what a awesome military mind. So are we a force of readiness? Are we prepared to do his work? Because today, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done. Yesterday was a very exhausting day for Jessica and I. We were out at Glendale Days, and it's just, we, we have kind of a, a side business that we don't make any money out. <laughs> but uh, we, we do it because of the ministry. We do it because of the people we get to talk to. We do it because it just takes that one little piece of just uh, you know, speaking to somebody about God. To me, that's, that's investment. I don't really care about anything else. You know, yesterday, I was going through some stuff, and I found some plastic parts broken in our booth, and I picked it up, and I said, man, somebody broke our camera. Didn't even have the integrity to walk downstairs and say what? I had broken it. But I told Jessica, I said, you know what? Don't worry about it. That's just worldly stuff. Who cares? Who cares? It'll be replaced, or I'll break something else. It doesn't matter. But does his light shine for others to see? When you go out someplace, does, does the kingdom follow you? Do people look and go, wow, all that person left me was with blessings and with good cheer? Or do you see church as a social club? I don't need a social club. I don't. Do we, Andrew? We don't need a social club. If you know anything about me, I'm perfectly okay with being alone on my property or I'm perfectly capable of being, I, I like being alone on the range. I like doing things by myself. So I'm not coming here for a social club. I'm coming here to be prepared. I'm coming here to fellowship with fellow warriors in Christ and, and waiting for the arrival of Jesus to come. I'm coming here to be prepared to work. Because if I love him with all my heart, mind, and soul, I want to work for him. I want to do a good deed for him. I want to tell the world about him. I don't want to come here just to go, yeah, I know, Alvin, we go to church together. I don't want just that. I want a relationship. I want a fellowship. I want to, I want to train and be equipped with fellow warriors. Since I retired from the Marine Corps, if I turn sideways, you can kind of see this belly growing. I started thinking about that today when I was on the treadmill punishing myself for eating that barbecue sandwich that I had yesterday and the brownie and ice cream, and then I followed that up with a tuna fish sandwich and some chips and some salsa, and then I chugged some water trying to make myself feel good about some kind of nutrition that I put in my body, and then I kind of, and then I kind of uh, uh, you know, justified that by saying, well, it was veteran-owned business. I was just supporting a fellow, fellow vet. Well, no, I really wanted that barbecue sandwich. He just happened to be my excuse for buying that barbecue sandwich. But I started thinking about that when I'm on the treadmill, and I think, and I just kind of th tell myself, I'm not training like I used to. I'm not training like I used to because I'm not around like-minded people who like to do things like that. I'm not training like I used to because, um, you know, when I, was, when I was in, I was in the gym for three hours in the morning with fellow Marines, and we were pushing each other. Because it wasn't about uh, looking good. It wasn't about having, you know, all this stuff. It was about being ready, a force of readiness, to be the most prepared when the nation is the least prepared. You know, that's what it was about. And somewhere along the way, when I retired, I didn't, I didn't train with fellow warriors. And I started losing a couple steps. I started losing a little bit of strength. 
uh, you know, my belly got a little bit over my belt loop there. You know, I tell Jessica, I said, please don't leave me because I'm getting fat. And she just laughs at me. But that's why it's important for us to get together and become together and iron sharpens iron, right? And looking each other in the face and asking us, are, are you ready? I can't tell you how many times I didn't get offended by that when people walked up to me when I was on active duty and told me, hey, you ready? I think so. Well, if I said I thought so, they just dragged me somewhere. Come here! You know, and, and we just started going somewhere, and I don't know, uh, they just started wearing me out. I had a, I had a buddy of mine, uh, he used to come in, and he'd, he'd have this log in his hand, and this log weighed like 60 pounds, and he'd go, you ready to go eat White Castle? And I'd be like, dude, you're psycho, what are you doing? He's like, I'm preparing for White Castle. <laughs> okay, John, I'll go with you to White Castle, but I'm not squatting that log for 20 minutes, all right? So... Uh, I, I, a question was brought up this week concerning members of a church going to see a certain movie. And that movie was The Exorcist. And I, and I read this post. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not saying anybody in here was doing it, but if you were, then, you know, hey, whatever. <laughs> so I read this post, and I started list, reading what these pastors were writing about it. And one of the pastors, he said, well, what do I do? How do I approach them in the church? Why do, how do I approach my congregation? And one said, and I, and I, and I just kind of was taken by this, he said, it's not your job to judge, leave them alone. Okay. You're right. It's not my job to judge, but it is my responsibility to watch over the flock. And I would really hope and pray that it, if I started going to the left and the right, that Denise, you would correct me. I really pray you would. Because I don't need a social club. I don't need you to pat me on the left side of my butt cheek and tell me good game. I don't need that. I don't want that. I want somebody who's going to look me in my face and say, uh, you've gotten a little weak in those pull-ups. You need to get your butt back up on the bar and lift some more weight, Marine. Hey, Christian, you're not doing what you need to do. You need to pick up that Bible and you need to read a little bit more and study. And look here, I'm going to come alongside you and I'm going to read and study with you. That's what I need. I don't need a social club. But I need to go to them in love and ask some questions. What's the difference? The difference is, is I'm not correcting you because I want to feel inferior, or I want to be, feel superior to you because I'm correcting you, James. I'm going to you because I love you. And I want you to grow. I didn't, it, my boys aren't here. I just looked. So Nate and Philip, you're just in their direction where Zach and Cody would sit, right? But I didn't discipline my boys because I wanted to feel macho and be superior to their father. I disciplined them because I wanted them to be better than I could ever become. And I told them that their whole lives. They would look at me and I'd say, Zach, Cody, I don't want you to be like me. I want you to be better than me. I want you to surpass everything I did. I, Cody, I don't want you to look up on the wall and see those ribbons and those badges and compare yourself to me. I want you to go beyond that. I want you to do much better things. That uniform, those ribbons, those medals, and all that stuff means nothing. That's just a byproduct. That's all that was. So don't, don't compare yourself. So when I go to you in love... And I ask you things, it's not for me to feel superior to you. Pastor Doug doesn't come to me and he says, I'm going to be superior to Pastor Fred. No, he comes to me in love. Pastor Jerry comes to me in love. Pastor Sean comes to me in love. Pastor Doug Spainhauer, who claims to be the meek one, comes to me in love. But I need that. And when it doesn't happen, do I grow? <clears throat> no. So a family member was listening to a certain song one day, and in those lyrics it said, I took a shot of cocaine and I ran, by Johnny Cash, right? And I'm sitting on the lanai, that's a fancy word for porch in Hawaii, and, my, and uh, they pull up and I go, I said, what are you doing, man? Nothing. I said, are you a Christian? He goes, yeah, of course I am, uncle. I asked him, do you believe it's your responsibility to spread the word of Christ wherever you go? He said, of course. And I said, well, how does that song promote the kingdom? And he just looked at me. And I said, I've been really studying Matthew 6, where it talks about seek first the kingdom and all will be added. So if I'm 
If I'm listening to that and I'm blaring that out my windows and I'm showing the world that I should take a shot of cocaine and run, what am I doing to the kingdom? Am I bringing it glory or am I tearing it down? So how does going, that, going to see that kingdom or going to see that movie promote the kingdom? I don't think it does. I'm going for research. <laughs> All right, whatever. So Luke 11, 33 and 36 says, No one lights a lamp and then hides it and puts it under a blanket or a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on the stand where the light, a light can be seen by all who enter the house. And your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, the whole body is filled with light. But when it's unhealthy, your body is filled with darkness. And make sure the light that you think you have is not actually darkness. Can we be confused sometimes? If you are filled with light with no dark corners, then your whole life will be radiant as though a floodlight were filling you with light. So Jessica used to sing this song, right, to our boys, and she sings it to her uh, kindergartners and preschoolers over there, and I'm going to try to do some justice in singing, so if I, if I don't do a good job and you just feel like running, I totally understand, all right? But she used to sing this, and she'd say, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see, for the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. She would sing that to our boys, and I would just sit on the couch. And even though I wasn't following Christ, I still believed my wife wasn't crazy when she'd say certain things. And I'd say, yeah, you're right. The kids don't need to watch that. Yeah, you're right. The kids don't need to see this. So we sing this to our kids, but we, can, we don't consider it. Why? Because I'm an adult? Because I can handle it? That plays right into entitlement, right? I'm an adult. I can handle it. Can you? Can you handle it? Well, I can tell you right now, I cannot handle it. Paul says, not everything is bad, but it's just not good for me. So I don't, I don't, I don't like to walk down slippery slopes because I know where those slippery slopes will take me. Say that ten times real fast, slippery slope, slippery slope. When I allow pride, entitlement, and lust to rise up, I compromise my integrity. I think we're on this slide now. <laughs> so Psalms 119, 1 and 3. Now go back, please. You're good. Thank you. It says, joyful people are full of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey in his laws. They search for him with all their what? Hearts. They do not compromise with evil and they walk only in his past so what happens when you start to compromise so I was really thinking about that word compromise this week and I have all kinds of examples of ways not to compromise like for one cranking your sleeves up like that well when you're deployed in country kicking your sleeves up like this that's a pretty big deal now, some people think they're cool because they throw their Oakley sunglasses on and they think they're like some kind of special, uh, special forces reconnaissance team because they wear Oakleys and they crank their sleeves up one time. Or maybe they sling their rifle in front of them and kind of pause like they're a, a fighter or something. But really, by cranking, cranking your sleeves up, what you're doing is compromising your uniform because it's flame retarded. So by exposing this part of the skin, if my Humvee was to blow up, what, was it, what would happen? I'd get burned. All because I decided to do what one day? Compromise. Something that small. Look at that. Compromise. And the whole flame would shoot up my, my cami blouse there and compromise, burn me all the way up. Some people saw it as, oh, I can't believe he's just going out here to correct me. Well, you just don't know who I am. <laughs> That's why you say that. White socks. Man, that was a huge issue in the military or in the Marine Corps for a while, white socks, you know. When the first got in country, Marines were complaining about their socks and how their socks weren't uh, combat effective. So a couple leaders in the Marine Corps decided to let their Marines wear white socks. Well, this other one over here, he decided they're not wearing white socks. 
And he was ridiculed by his fellow commanders because he, just, he, he stood his ground. He said, my Marines will not wear my white socks because according to Marine Corps order, Pop 10 20.34 Foxtrot states that the Marine Corps uniform will be wearing a, either a coyote tan or a green sock at the time. And he said, I'm not compromising. So even though he was picked on by a couple other commanders because they uh, released the, the reins a little bit and allowed those Marines to wear white socks, he refused to do so. So he wrote a letter about what's the big deal about white socks. And when I read this letter, I thought, he's absolutely correct. Because once you allow them to compromise in one single little area and allow comfort to set in, what else decides to get compromised? That's why they were so strict on every single thing that we did. That's why we couldn't go out and buy our own personal equipment. Unless it had the Eagle Globe and Anchor on it, we couldn't wear it. Some people saw that as a big deal. I saw that as instant obedience orders. Because if you're faithful in the little things, you're going to be faithful in the bigger things, right? So right before I retired, I was on Quantico, Virginia, because I love Quantico, Virginia. They got hills like this. Sometimes they lean back. And uh, they said, hey, where do you want to go for, for your final physical at? And I said, man, Quantico. I want to go to Quantico. Why? You know why. I want to go run the hills. So my faithful best friend in the world, Jessica, went with me. And we stayed in the, uh, the hotel there on base. And I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning. She said, where are you going? I'm going to run some hills. Be back in an hour and a half. Right? Two hours went by. She was like, where is he? I got lost. <laughs> if, you get lost if you get lost in, uh, in the Marine Corps on a run in the morning, just, <laughs> oh, the shell hall's that way. So that must be civilization. Let me go that way. I came out of the woods without a shirt on, had mud all over me. And there was just young Marines standing there. And I said, hey, man, I'm lost. Where's the, chow or where's the hotel? Uh, right there, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Got back to the hotel room. But I enjoyed my run. And, you know, I enjoyed being in Quantico. We left a little early because uh, it was during the, the, the scandemic. And everything was closed. So I didn't get to go to the Marine Corps Museum. So I decided, well, let's just go on back to Ohio, O-H-I-O. <laughs> I did that for you, Caden. Pastor Sean wasn't paying attention. So we get out the gas station, and I get out the gas station, and I'm in something like this, you know, and I'm, I'm pumping gas in my car, and I see this young Marine pull up, and he doesn't have a blouse on, he doesn't have a cover on, and he's pumping gas. And I said to myself, I'm retiring. I'm not going to say anything. So I just kept pumping my gas. But that little Marine Corps devil dog in me was doing flutter kicks. And it was like, you can't let this go. So I walked over to him and I took my ID card out and I said, hey, how are you, man? I wanted to get my ID because I looked like Joe Shrove Civilian. I wanted to make sure that he knew I was a fellow brother. And I said, hey, man, I just want to let you know uh, that's who I am. Can I ask you a couple questions? I really wasn't asking for permission to ask him questions, you know. And he says, uh, yes. And I said, okay, awesome. Uh, where's your blouse? Who are you? And he says, well, I'm corporal whatever. And I said, well, I can't tell because I don't see any rank and I don't see a name tape. Where's your blouse at? Where's your cover at? And he said, well, I was doing some martial arts training this morning. Awesome. What belt are you going for? Well, I'm going for green belt. That's awesome, man. It's important for us to become warriors in every situation we're in, man. That's awesome. So did you punch somebody in the face this morning? This is what Marines talk about, right? Yes. Oh, great. So what happened after you was done? Did you wear your blouse and cover to the martial arts pit? He goes, yeah, I left my barracks. I put it right on. Well, that's good. So what happened when you got to the pit? Well, I put it in my car. Oh, okay. So is it still in your car? Yes. Because <laughs> at that time, he knew I was what? And, it, and he thought I was going to scream and holler at him. But instead I said, you know, Corporal, I'm retiring. And in six more months, the Marine Corps is going to forget all about me. But I don't care about that. I care about the legacy I leave behind. And the moment that I let, someone, I let a standard unchecked walk by me, that just becomes the new standard. And the last time I, I, I knew that we were always held to the highest standards. That's why we're called the few and the proud. That's why, that's why we represent less than 1% of America's population, and we represent less than 10% of the armed forces. We're held to a higher standard wherever we go. 
And I said, the moment, moment you compromise that high standard, what are you setting the example for the young Marines below you? You're allowing them to compromise their standards. So what do you think we need to do right now? And he says, well, I need to go put my blouse and cover on, Master Sergeant. I think that's a great idea. Let's go ahead and do that. So he dawned and cleared it. Don't take part in worthless deeds or evil darkness. Instead, expose them. When you see compromise happening, you have to expose it. It's not easy for me to expose it. Some people think that I like going and um, correcting people. I do not. I would rather be at my house drinking coffee, <laughs> watching a, 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 a documentary on uh, something, or uh, watching The Rifleman, right? I would rather be on my property chainsaw, chainsawing trees and, and working around the yard. I don't want that life anymore. I, don't, I didn't ask for that. But it's what we're supposed to do if we're fellow warriors and Christians in the body of Christ, right? So do not compromise, but expose them to light. Stop with the rinse and repeat, and let's drink from the living water. Like we talked about last time, Pastor Jerry said, sprinkle a little bit of Jesus on it. Yeah, I like that. Because sometimes if we sprinkle a little bit of Jesus on things, we just feel all good about it. We can go out here and we can say, we need to do this and we need to do that. But this isn't right. And me and my spouse ain't doing right. But I'm going to go out here and sprinkle some Jesus on stuff and it's going to be okay. Is that what the Word teaches us? If you think that's what the world teaches you, come to me, please. Open your Bible and show me. I want to see it. Show me where it's written. The world is inviting you to be a, a prodigal son or a daughter. We compromise with pagan traditions and ways of life because we're too afraid of what those around us might think. You don't celebrate Halloween? No. Why? Because I don't believe it's right. Didn't you used to? There's a lot of things I used to do. I'm sure there's some, I'm sure there's some, uh, some evidence of things I used to do out there. Doesn't mean I participated anymore. And, and that's just a small piece. You know, Paul went to the Corinthians, and he was talking to the Corinthians. And why was he dealing with the Corinthians? Because they were living in the world, and they were compromising by going with pagan traditions. That's why he said, wake up! <laughs> Thank you, Gracie. If you got, does anyone know Bishop Scott Gillum? All right, good. A few of you guys do. If you ever read his Facebook stuff, it's pretty good sometimes. He wrote this on there, and it kind of hit me right in my face when I read this. It said, don't compromise your integrity for popularity. Don't compromise your integrity with popularity. Self wants to be popular. Those who die to self want to forward, the God, forward God's kingdom. Those who want to continue with self, they just forward their own kingdom. And disguises that a little bit of Jesus. They may say things that could be half true. If you get on YouTube today, you can see all kinds of pastors out there, and you can listen to them, and I even hear them, and I go, yeah, that's, that's, that says, whoa, wait a minute, Wills came off the bus there. What did you say? That's why it's important for us to dig into the Word of God and study it. The world may never remember my lame, name, however, however, as long as God knows my name, I don't really care. I don't really care. He, point me, he put me in a position to do something. I seek counsel when I do things. I don't do things on my own. I don't go out here and just go to the world. There's four other people that I go to. You hold me accountable as well, right? If you don't, you should. So I'm not just going out here going, oh, I'm just going to do whatever I want. Matter of fact, when I do do things, I always send out a text to all the other elders. What do you guys think? Should I do this? Should I not do this? Should I move forward? Should I go to the left? Go to the right? What do I do? Where two or three are gathered in my name, right? He tells me to go out in twos. I mean, all over the Bible. He didn't say, uh, go it by yourself. Go do your own thing. Oh, you got it. You've learned it all, Jessica. You don't need to go to school anymore, right? Just Richard's like, yeah, right. <laughs> Eventually, if I'm down here long enough, my name's going to be on a tombstone and it's going to fade away. In, in May of every year, we go down to Muhlenberg County, Kentucky, and we go to a thing called Decoration Day, Homecoming. You know, And that's where we go to uh, Greenbrier Baptist Church, which is about as big as a sound booth right there. 
And we go there, and I hear stories about my family and how great-grandpa Jones led a donkey down the center of the church. Still not sure about that whole story and why people tell me that, but that's what they told me, right? And then we walk out to the cemetery, and, it, and I can walk out there now, and I can look at little David, and I can say, I can do the same thing that my daddy did to me. I can say, come here, David. That's your great-grandpa. Man, what an awesome man he was. That's your great-great-grandpa. That's your great-great-great-grandpa. That's your great-great-great-great-grandpa. And I can go all the way down the line to the year 1786. That's how deep our family goes down there in the holler in Kentucky. But as you get closer to the end, what's the tombstone starting to do? They're starting to fall apart. They're starting to deteriorate. And then all that becomes is a story but I don't know much about it. Well, that's how we're going to be right now. One day, our, it's just going to be a memory of us. It's going to be a story. I've already told Jessica, listen, I don't want a tombstone. I don't want anything. Just, you know, hey, <laughs> burn the body, throw them out in journal populations in a veteran cemetery because it's free, and then wave by and then go. Because I don't want anyone to remember me for anything other than two things, how much he loved the Lord and how much he loved people around him. That's it. I don't care about anything else. I do not care about anybody else. And I told my boys, I said, if you put me in those dress blues, when I die, I'm coming back, and I'm going to beat you up. I'm going to be standing there at the gates of heaven, and they're going to say, Dad, and I'm just going <laughs> to pop them right in the mouth as soon as I see them, right? Because I hate that uniform, right? But that, none of that matters. What matters is, is how much I love God and how much I love the people around me and how much I devoted myself to them for the kingdom in order to forward progress. That's really all that matters. We must be careful because when we ignore our surroundings and stop looking at our foundations, according to 1 Corinthians 3.10, self creeps his ugly head back in, and before we know it, we are left standing in the wake. In the kingdom, we cannot rely on ourselves. Uh, we can't make it. The only way we need to make it is uh, to lay down ourselves and fully submit to God. Fully submit to God. Fully submit. Fully submit. Next slide. I remembered that time. Oh, wow. What was I thinking when I put that up? I was probably thinking, let me get through this slide. So Paul talks about in chapter 3, he's talking to the Galatians, and he says, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. So let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Raise your hand if you received the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses. There's no hand up. I'm surprised. Of course not. You received the Spirit because you what? Believed in the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be, Freddie, after starting your new life in the Spirit, you are now trying to become perfect by your own human effort. So when I was reading that today, uh, uh, well, for the last couple weeks, I, I put my name in there. How stupid can you be, Freddie, that you started in the Spirit and now you're trying to finish on your own human effort? Why? What happened? Where did the wheels come off the bus? Where did you start believing that you were that good? When did you look in the, the newspaper and thought, man, I am awesome. Look at that. Look at my resume, Lord. Woo, look at me. When? <laughs> Crazy. Next slide. So Jesus talks about where our human effort is going to take us. He talks about Matthew 7, 13 through, 13 through 14. He says, you can, enter God's, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and the gate is wide for many who choose the way, but the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is complex. And here's the thing that really made me want to cry. Only a few ever find it. So as I'm out at Glendale days yesterday, Jessica walks up to me and she goes, what's wrong? And I said, I just feel troubled. Because every single person that walks by me, what do I want to do? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? You know Jesus? Have you accepted him? Is he not just your Lord, but your shepherd? Are you laying down your life every single day? 
Every single body that walked past me. When I was driving to church this morning, I was listening to uh, the, the, the Lion of Judah, right? And I just kept looking at people walking about their day, and they were walking their dog, and they were going for a run, and they were doing all these things, and I just kept praying for their salvation. So I don't know where they're at. So I want to pray where they're at. Where, where are they, Lord? You know their hearts. So very few find it. So here's some questions. Next slide. Here's some questions that came to my mind when I was meditating on these scriptures. Why is the gate to kingdom, why is the gate to the kingdom narrow and the highway to hell wide? Why do many people choose to walk down a broad way versus walking down the narrow? And why is the narrow road difficult and very few find it? So as I was meditating, the this is what I believe. This isn't thou saith the Lord. This is what I believe when I was meditating upon this. Well, the gate is narrow because God doesn't need your ego to enter into the kingdom. He makes it narrow because we have to take off this big thing that's on our head that thinks uh, I'm about to go promote self in the kingdom. And we have to do what with it? Slay it to the side. And the road to hell is why? Because egos need room. And they love to travel together. Large egos love to travel together so they can water each other <laughs> as they go. Well, the other day I did this. Oh, yeah, I did this. And I did this, you know. It's like going in the gym and meeting those weird people who dedicate everything to, you know, pumping iron. Look at my pump. No, look at my pump, you know. And I'm over here on my machine going, I wish they'd get out of the way of the mirror so I could grab a weight. That's Richard. He's in front of the mirror. <laughs> Brother, man, come on. Jesus also reminds us about the eye of the needle in Matthew 23 and 24. Jesus talks to his disciples and he says, Surely I say to you that it is hard. It says rich, but I want you to add something in there. Self-righteous man. Because it doesn't matter how much money you have. He's talking about self-righteous man. So I say it's hard for a self-righteous man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. So what is an eye of a needle? He's not talking about the needle you sew with, is he, Caden? What's he talking about? Yeah, talking about the door where that camel has to go into the city. In order for the camel to fit inside the city, they had to take the saddlebags off, all these bags. And I can only imagine, you know, the... the the, the, the person that was riding this camel because they had to take all the bags off, then they had to get the camel through the door, right? And then what did they have to do? Lug all the baggage back onto the camel and get inside the city. So he says it's easier for that camel to get inside the city than it is for a self-righteous man to enter into the kingdom. Think about the young ruler. The self-righteous young ruler, right? He was feeling good for about 30 seconds, wasn't he? Jesus, teacher, what do I do in order to, uh, to enter into the kingdom of heaven? And he tells him what? Obey all the commandments. And the young ruler goes, Woo! Yeah! I've done that since birth, baby! Right? And then Jesus looks straight into his heart. And he says, Good! Now go sell all your possessions and give it to the poor and follow me. I bet you could hear a pin drop. Because at that point, he knew what? That he was self-righteous. See, when he thought he had it all figured out, right? I've obeyed everything. Jesus saw right into his heart. When David says, search me, O Lord, that's a dangerous, dangerous thing to ask. Because you better believe He's going to reveal it to you. Well, I don't know God. Well, ask God to reveal himself to you. He will. But be prepared. Be prepared. 1 John 5.21, he says, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take the place of God in your heart. Anything. So what is in your life making you self-righteous? I know what it is for me. What is it for you? What's stopping you from going just a little bit more further down the road? 
We must lose the baggage. The road to hell is wide and we can carry all kinds of baggage. And guess what? The enemy likes it when we carry baggage. He likes it when we have all this stuff on our shoulders because we start to feel like I can do it. Right? It's kind of like, uh, I don't know, kind of like we're in the Marine Corps or in the Army, whatever it was. And you got this large pack on your back, right, Andrew? And then one of your soldiers falls out, so what do you do? You put their pack on top of yours. And you go, I can do it. And then when you're 47, he's 48, just want to point that out. He's older than me. <laughs> your knees are hurting. Your back's hurting. You're, you're, even though you didn't know that it was going to hurt later in life, sin creeps itself in. And what does it start to happen over time? It starts to hurt. It starts to hurt. And when we carry our own weight and we start to feel a little bit of self-pride in ourselves, Richard, what do we do? We take the easy road because we have these two packs on our back and we're walking down the road and we see this big mountain before us. Oh, I don't know, Lord. That looks stupid. Yeah, I'm not doing that. I'll see you on the other side. I'm going to go this way. Well, that road leads to destruction. It just looks easy, but that's how the enemy likes for things to look to me, isn't it? Because down that road is full of IEDs, landmines, hand grenades, snipers, ambushes. Whatever terminology you want to use, it's waiting for you. It's going to bring up old habits, old thoughts into your mind. The enemy knows how to trip you. He knows how to trick you. He's been around for years and years and years and years. He knows the Word of God. How do you think he tricked Adam and Eve? He knows the Word. He has knowledge of it, but he doesn't know the Word, the living Word, because he abandoned that a long time ago. So he just lives off of his little sneaky schemes that he thinks, right? So number two is, why do so many people choose to walk down the broad versus walking down the marrow? Well, it's easy to follow the path of least resistance, isn't it? When I'm walking down the road like the world is, and it tells me I'm a sojourner in this world, I don't belong to this world, do I, Kimberly? I don't belong to it. We don't belong to it. Pastor Jerry, one time, I remember this, I don't know why this just popped in my head, man, but I got like a reel of highlights from Pastor Jerry, right? Do you remember when we used to do the, the, uh, the hoo-yah thingamajiggers out here? We used to give people snow cones and bouncy houses and all this stuff, and uh, this kid walked up to you, I don't know if you remember this, but this kid walked up to you, I was standing next to you, and his kid goes, you're strange. He goes, that's because I'm not of this world, you know? <laughs> and I was thinking, man, that kid will never be back. But that's okay, because guess what? We are strange. We're not of this world. When people look at your taxes and, and they find out how much you've given the charity, what do they do? Are you crazy? You could have taken all that money and invested it in blah, 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 gotten 4.9% or 5.1% over 18 months, and look how much money you would have had. So, what's your point? Because the word tells me, if I seek the kingdom with everything I have, then he will provide everything that I need. But the world's there to remind me that I'm crazy. And like I tell people, it's okay, you don't have to tell me I'm crazy. I got some paperwork that says I'm crazy. So it's easy to follow the path of least resistance. And Jesus says in John 16, 20, uh, 16 33, he says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Peace in who? Jesus. Peace in Christ. Not peace in self, peace in Christ. Here on earth, you will go through many trials and sorrows, heartbreaks, troubles. You're going to get made fun of. You're going to get picked on. You're going to look, be looked down upon. You're going to get your job taken away from you. You're going to lose your income. Your car is going to break down. I don't know, fill in the blank somewhere. But he says this, take heart because I have what? I've overcome all that. It's just the way of the enemy just continuing to, just like a little chihuahua on the back of your hill. Just bite. You just want to turn around and go, book. <laughs> Score. So when we start to believe the world, the enemy separates us and comes between us and God. In order to defeat someone, you've got to cut off communications. If I can't communicate to God or I'm too ashamed to go to God and repent for what I did, then it just cuts off my communications. And when the enemy cuts off the communications, he goes, aha, now I've got him right where I want him. Because now I'm going to start hovering in a corner. 
Now I'm going to start avoiding as much as possible because I don't want to come to terms. I don't want to repent. He knows he can win, but when you set out on a path by yourself without anyone with you, because that's what happens when he cuts off communications. You just say, well, I'm just going to go set off my own little path. It's easy for you to quit. It's easy for you to quit when you're by yourself because no one knows you're quitting. If I set a goal tomorrow morning that I'm going to do this and this and this, the only one that knows that I didn't set that, uh, com- uh, uh, complete that goal is me. So I can justify it by saying, yeah, I'm good. No one else knew about it. I'm okay. It's not good for man to be alone, Genesis 2.15. I must be, I must have someone to be held accountable to. I need someone who's going to pull me by the back of my shirt. I need someone who's going to hold my hand. I need someone to help me get through. On New Year's Eve, people will begin to start their New Year's resolution, uh, but only 9% will complete them. Why do they fail? No accountability. You'll see the gyms full (laughs) on January 3rd, probably, right? 2nd, 3rd. And then around January 20th, they'll be empty. Why? Because they just experienced a little bit of pain. Whenever I used to train with people uh, to get them ready for different things in the military, I'd work out with them, but I'd always caution them about that third week. I said, on that third week, you're going to feel a little bit of pain. But don't quit. Use that day to stretch. Use that day to, uh, uh, you know, drink some water, stretch, maybe walk, do a little bit of light exercise, but get through that threshold. Get through that threshold of pain. Don't quit. Because it's easy to quit. Some people don't like that word accountability, so I'll just use it like this. How about you have no true friends when you have no accountability? I don't know how much more clear that can come to you. If someone's not coming to you and holding you accountable and speaking truth into your life, then they are not your friend. You need to cut bait, walk away, and get away from them. And go find somebody that's going to look you in the eye and say, Sean, wake up! Because you know what? Only the enemy wants me to fall asleep. Only the enemy wants me to be complacent. Only the enemy wants me to be comfortable. I didn't get that in my last career. And I don't want it amongst us. And if you don't like it when somebody comes to you, do what I do. Shut your mouth. Go home. Pray about it. The first thing I always go is I look at myself and go, hmm, is that me? But i got to hold my tongue back because I can easily say, oh, yeah, well, you. Yeah, you're right. We all mess up, don't we? So if no one's there to hold you accountable, maybe you don't have any true friends. They rely on themselves for success, and at the first sight of pain, like I said, they fall away. When I first tried to quit dipping, notice the key word, I. As soon as it got hard, as soon as I faced adversity, I returned to those old habits, those old habits of comfort. Because believe it or not, it's just something about, that's what I used to think. Anytime stress came up and operational tempo got high, you seen like 99% of the boardroom. So I used something of this world to subdue a feeling that instead of reaching out to God's word, And searching for him, I went to a substance. And we do that all the time. We're guilty of that all the time. To me, it might have been tobacco, but to you, it might have been ibuprofen. My big toe hurts, let me go to the doctor. It could be anything, right? So Philippians 4, 6, and 7 tells me not to be anxious about anything. But instead, through prayer and petition, reach out to God. And his peace which transcends all understanding, will guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. Do not be anxious. Do not be depressed. Do not be jittery. You fill it in with everything else you can. But to go to him. Is that hard? Yes, because sometimes God's not going to give it to us instant gratification. Because he also says that no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. However, uh, he produces a 
uh, 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 oh man, where did I go? Help me out. The harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. That's why you need brothers. Did you see what just happened? Yeah. Harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. I need to know that just because I asked for it doesn't mean that God has to give it to me right there on the spot. He's not Netflix or Amazon Prime or anything else. He's not that way. The world was waiting on me as soon as I picked the habit up. Where were they going? Hey, man, can I, can I get a chew from you? <laughs> yeah, welcome back. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for hooking me up. Was he a friend? Obviously not. Obviously not. Or when I decided to stop cussing. I remember that day. I said, you know what? I'm in discipleship class. Pastor Jerry is teaching me. I'm going to quit cussing. Woo! That lasted like 20 minutes. <laughs> that was like 20 minutes. I walked into a boardroom and some, somebody said something stupid. You know, and next thing I know, I flipped a table, threw a chair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, my buddy, he was right outside the door and he goes, Now that's the guy we remember. Welcome back, dude! The enforcer's back! felt that big because as soon as he said that to me I realized how much I needed God so once again I failed and the enemy was there to deliver some comfort yeah he delivers some comfort to you and discouragement at the same time the devil said don't worry son it's okay stick to what you know it's too hard it's too hard to do all that hey look how successful you have been without him he took Jesus up on the mountain. He said, look at all these kingdoms I will give to you. And that's what he does to you. Look at all these kingdoms I've given to you. Because sin's like credit card debt, right? You don't feel it all at once. But then when you, when you can no longer answer the call, the creditors come calling. So he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he sets out to do. He lies to you. You got to look him back and as Pastor Jerry said on many times, he says, make them pay. When you fall, repent and make the enemy pay. And when I fall, when I fall and I repent, I know my neighbors hear me. Because <laughs> I am yelling, screaming, preaching the word of God, telling that dude he is not welcome in this home. The next time he comes home, I'm going to kick him right in the mouth with a sidekick of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to break out the sword of the Spirit, and I'm going to jab them right in the heart with it. You're not welcome here. Don't touch my children. Don't come around my wife. Don't look my beagle in the eye. Stay away. Stay away. And, and, when, and when you speak the word of God, guess what he has to do? He's got to get out of there. He's got to go. He's got to run away. Like a dog he threw scalded water on. All the way across the yard, man. Get him out of here. And then I go further. Get out of my neighborhood. Get out of my street. Get out of my town. Get out of my state. Make them pay. Use the word. God tells us not to rely on our own wisdom, doesn't he? He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your what? Your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do. All you do. Judges chapter 1 this week, I was, uh, we, this, that's the next ch uh, book the family's reading, right? And the very first words out the gate were, they seek, the, uh, they seek God in every battle they were in. And so I sent out a question to the family. I said, they seek the Lord in every single battle they were in. Uh, how many times are you seeking the Lord in your daily life? Because their life's dependent on it. But we can't even walk 10 feet, or we walk 10 feet on our own. Is that smart? No. Because there could be something there for us. Don't seek your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed by your own wisdom like the Pharisees and the Sadducees were. They were impressed by their own wisdom. They relied on their own wisdom. They, they looked at people, and people said something to them, and they said, that's not what the Word of God said. But what I should do is, is I should go over here, and I should grab this book right here and say, okay, show it to me. Because as soon as the Sadducees and the Pharisees looked in the Word of God, they looked in the Scriptures, they noticed that Paul was telling the truth. 
Don't lean on your own understanding. Your own understanding is going to lead you down a road of death and destruction. Don't think you got it all figured out because you don't. Don't be impressed by your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will uh, have healing for your body and strength for your bones. That's Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. See, we start to fall into self-righteousness when we, we, and we begin uh, uh, telling God that, hey, hey, uh, this is what I'm going to do today, Lord. Uh, so if you don't mind, if you could just do that over there, I'll handle this over here. Uh, yeah. Got it? I guess I'm the only one that does that, huh? It's okay. I'll just preach to myself. Otherwise, I'd find myself disqualified, right? We pray for things. Here's, here's, here's me. Here's me. Here's me. Like two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I was praying and praying and praying and praying. Lord, show me something. Lord, give it to me. Lord, I need it. Lord, show it to me. Boom! And then I was like, I don't really like the way you, you give me that, Lord. And I went to Jessica and I said, babe, look at this. I got this, this, and 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 this is my schedule. Holy smokes. So then I went to Every Man a Warrior and I did Lesson 7 out of the book. And the Lesson 7 was over, don't be anxious about anything. And I was like, you're so good. You're so good. We complain. When he even gives us our prayers we answer for, we complain because it's not in our format. It's not in the Turabian style. (laughs) <laughs> we pray for things and when the Lord delivers we complain about that right we, we love saying Isaiah 6 and 8 send me O Lord woo I'm ready okay Lord well I know I just said that but I got a few things I just want to clear up first of all when you send me somewhere can I be in charge I really don't like listening to other people. Hey, I just, I just emailed you my resume, Lord. Just keep that in mind. Lord, you know, you know when I said that send me, well, you know, Jessica and I just made plans to go somewhere. So can I go next year instead of this year, please? I'll be ready then, I promise. Yes, Lord, I'm ready. But instead of that, hey, can I do this? Because this is my strength. This is what I am. This is what I do. And when you put me here, I can shine. So please don't allow the world to see my weaknesses and don't allow them to see your strengths through me. Yeah, we like that. We like saying, send me, O Lord. We want to be all in, but then we... uh, we put limitations on God and how he delivers it. Well, if you want to be all in the kingdom, you can't put limitations on God. The road is very difficult and very few find it because we are still looking for self in the kingdom. We treat our walk like we're navigating in the daytime. What I mean by that is uh, day land navigation versus night land navigation. When they teach it to you, you got a compass in your hand. And they teach you that you need to rely on your compass. This is how you convert this to a map or from a map to a compass shooting your, your stuff. I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of terminology, uh, but a click is a kilometer. It, <laughs> but so you start out, you, you start out strong. <laughs> you liked that, didn't you? <laughs> you start out strong and you got your compass out and you go, all right, here we go. Okay. Tree. Got it. Puts it in his pocket. Cause what do I see? I can see the tree. Right, that's where I'm headed. So let me check it out again. Oh, Nope, got off track. Let me go this way again. And then I put it back in my pocket, and then I start focusing again on this other little object over here. And then if you've ever done land navigation in the military, it's pretty, sometimes it's pretty easy because you can see the trail of thousands of people before you who have walked it, right? But sometimes you get to the end of that trail. If you go to more advanced uh, land navigation, you get to the end of that trail, and there's like three boxes, boom, boom, boom. And you're like, oh, man, didn't see that coming. Which box is it? Well, I'm still asking for wisdom and re-checking my compass and maybe going back to the foundation and re, uh, re-checking uh, my tracks, I just go, ah, let's just write this number down, 25. All right, that sounds good. And then we try to cheat. Hey, what numbers you get for this one? Oh, yeah, 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 28, got it. Nightland navigation is an entirely different story. 
And I, I experienced this uh, in Okinawa, Japan, in the middle of a jungle, during jungle warfare training, because you can't see anything in the daytime, much less the night. So what am I doing the whole way? All right, guys, let's go. Wait. Okay. Oh. All right. All the way there. That compass didn't what? It didn't go in that pocket. It stayed out the whole time. What's the difference? Well, when I start to think I'm better than I am, I start to rely on my sight. And sometimes, God, when it's convenient for me. At night, I can't see. I'm blind. And I totally rely on him. Faith. So in Matthew 7, 21 and 23, Jesus talks to his disciples. He says, now everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of the Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we have prophesied in your name. Can you imagine somebody saying, look, let me tell you what I did. Whoa, 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 before you get the final verdict up here, let me tell you what I did. I prophesied in your name. Hey, remember that time me and Pastor Sean, we were casting out demons in your name, baby. Woo! I was preaching everywhere. Man, we were, we were, we were performing miracles. And then he looks at me and he goes, who are you? I never knew you. You think about that for a minute. Who are you really doing it for? Are you doing it for the name on your right that says Jones? Or are you doing it on the name on the left that I talked about last week that says believer and follower of Christ Jesus? Who do you really want to shine? Do you want to be the pastor of Elizabethtown? <laughs> I'll have Pastor Sean tell you about that one. Or you just want to be someone who's right, uh, uh, having Jesus ride in on you, like the donkey, right? Like Pastor Tim Rigdon says. I'm just the donkey Jesus rode in on. He talks about you who broke God's laws. Well, what law did we break? Well, we compromise our relationship by allowing the world to dictate our walk. We compromise our relationship and we allow the world to dictate our walk. When I sin, it's an idolatry issue. It's a heart issue. I have been unfaithful to God, and I have been unfaithful to my wife. Well, this is why I say that, because he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor. Who's my first neighbor? Jessica. So when I sin, it's a heart issue. I've been unfaithful to him, and I've been unfaithful for her. So how much repenting do I need to get done? I need to fall on my knees to my face, and don't worry about who's next to me. Oh, look at Pastor Fred on his face. That's right! I am on my face. Won't you get down and practice some? When we were up in the Great Smoky Mountains, I was running one morning. And, uh, you know, it's amazing what the Lord talks to me about in my running because he takes my mind off the pain that I'm in. Uh, I got home that morning and I looked at Jessica. Jessica was making my coffee. And I looked at her and I said, I said, babe, I apologize. And she looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, because I haven't loved you like I always should have loved you. And there's been times that I put other things before you. And I apologize. And she answered, would I forgive you? When we're seeking the Lord with all our heart, mind, and soul, he's going to reveal things to us. When we're... Uh, ministering with people, using intimate encounters, he's going to speak to me too. When I'm ministering to somebody, the Lord's going to minister to me. And then at that choice, I got a couple choices I can make. Either I can be obedient and follow my face and listen to the word of God, or I can just go, it's all right, Lord, I'll just continue to push through. Placing idols in our life. Deal children, keep away from what? Anything. Anything that comes between you and God. Last slide, I think we're on 10 somewhere. I got out of whack. That usually happens. Yeah, one before that, maybe. Yeah, I think we're there. All right. I'm going to throw a book at you. It's called Charles Sheldon. It's called In His Steps. I think we went too far. I'm not really sure we're out on the slide presentation. Just kind of ignore that, all right? If you want to get with me later and give me some etiquette and PowerPoint, I'd be glad not to listen. So in the book, Charles Sheldon, it says, In His Steps, it's a really great book, and 
It really talks about what it really means to follow that old punchline, what would Jesus do? Charles, in this book, there's a pastor, and he invites people to go on a journey with him for a year to really put Jesus first in everything, their, their business, their life, everything. And they really find that it's really difficult because how much self has been in the way that they didn't realize it. And in that book, Charles Sheldon says, Jesus is a great divider of life. One must walk, walk parallel with him or directly across his way. We must walk with Jesus. We must lay on our face every single day and cry out to God. And we must, we must, we must cry out to the Holy Spirit to guide us on our journey. When you enter in a journey, everyone needs a map and everyone needs a guide. And that's the Holy Spirit. He's my map. He's my guide. And all I got to do is be instant obedient to what he's saying. I think we're on the next slide now. What a trooper. Thanks, buddy. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake uh, and the Gospels will save it. The only way to surrender is to let Jesus come first in your life. No, I'm not going to lynch anybody. Pastor told me today, he said, who are you hanging? Oh, seemed like a logical question. So this came to me. And the last time this was actually shown to me, if my sister's watching, I don't know if she is or not today, she might remember this. I was uh, seven years old, I think, Cleveland, Tennessee. Mom dropped us off at church. My sister, I think she was 16 or so. Chancellor, where you at? Come over here and undo this thing. Don't you love Chancellor? Undo that and hurry up quick. You got 20 seconds. 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. You should be done. It's amazing. All right. So when I was seven years old, I was in this church. Don't know who the guy was. Really don't know who he was. I remember sitting next to my sister because they didn't have like a children's church or something. So I had to sit with the high schoolers because me and Samantha are six and a half years apart, almost seven years apart. She's more like a mom to me than my sister because she was always like, straighten up. <laughs> as soon as mom and dad left for work, she was in charge. I hope you heard that. Anyway, so I went to church and he said, he, you know, the guy was talking about, you can't do this on your own. You can't do this on your own. There's no way that you're going to enter the kingdom on your own. There's just no way. So I was sitting here and I, if I had a picture of me at seven years old, I'd put it up on the screen. I was this bright redheaded little kid with little freckles all over, kind of chubby, right? Uh, if you've ever seen Zach's baby pictures, that's me, right? And he says, come here, kid. Come on up here. Grab this rope. Grab a rope. Of course, at seven years old, I didn't think I could be defeated, right? Come here, Scott. This is my boy, Blue. <laughs> and he grabs this. Oh, you got a boot on, man. I forgot. You want to sit down? You can just sit down. He can't pull you. <laughs> All right. So when I was a kid, here I was, and I couldn't find anybody else smaller today. So I should have had Natalie come up. That's okay. You know what? You'll sit down. Natalie, come here. Hurry up. Run, 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 run. Quick. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. See how they answer the call? <clears throat> so Natalie was actually bigger than me, right? And so the guy said, here's your walk with Jesus, here's the enemy. It's okay, I still love you. Right. And here you are. So pull. Pull her. Pull. Pull her. Pull. Pull. Come on, pull. 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 Stop. I was so mad. When this happened to me, my face was bright red. I was ready to tackle that dude and chew his ankles off, right? Because my father always told me, don't you ever lose. Don't ever quit. And I was like, man, I will chew that guy's ankles off. I still remember my sister coming over to me and going, it's okay, Bubby. It's okay. You know? But how much did she try to pull Scott? Did she try? 
Yeah, if she, if she really wanted to, she would have ran over there and did some ninja flying chop kick, and <laughs> we'd have been putting another boot on Scott, you know. <laughs> Next slide. But the battle's not fought alone. The battle's not fought alone, because when I surrender my life, God comes up, put your cell phone down, quit texting. <laughs> God grabs the rope. And then he says, now I'm going to send my son to die for your sins. Put your books down. Hurry up quick. Get over there. Get on the rope. And then he says, Jesus said, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to still be with you, and I'm going to send a comforting spirit. Who's more comforting than Miss K? You better hurry up and get over there. And then he says, I'm going to give you the word. And then the disciples say, teach me to pray. Kimberly, come on up. And then he says, I'm going to give you somebody to fellowship with. And we're still in the back over here. And then we snarl down the enemy. And we say, come on, devil, what do you got? Somebody lost an insole. <laughs> Somebody was pulling so hard they lost a hen sole. Let me see if that fits my foot. No, it's not mine. We'll just leave that alone. Was that your insole? You got that? You can go to Australia and repel them later. So the battle's not one on my own. Oh, oh, oh. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke every single sickness in this church right now. Yeah. Worship team, come on up, please. Hey, the battle's not fought alone. You're not meant to fight alone. You're not meant to fight alone. He's given us all kinds of tools. He said, son, daughter, lay down your life and I'll come to you. God comes to us. Jesus comes and he lays down his life. He goes to the cross for you. Amen. He didn't have to. He decided to. He didn't have to. He decided to. And he stayed up there. What kept him up there? The love for you, Richard. He loves us, Dale. Isn't that awesome? The God of the universe that created everything loves us. And then he said, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. I got him out of order, but it's okay. You guys get the idea. I'm going to give my Holy Spirit to you. And then I'm going to give you the word. And then I'm going to translate it I'm going to give it the power to, to, to Martin Luther so he can come out and have it translated to the common man. It's no longer going to be a secret. I just baptized Tammy. Sorry. <laughs> it's no longer going to be a secret. And then I'm going to give you fellowship. I'm going to give you Jimmy James. I'm going to give you Olin. I'm going to give you Miss Laura. I'm going to give you Madeline. I'm going to give you Nate. And teach me how to pray, Lord. Teach me how to pray. Because that's my long-range weapon. I can reach anybody from anywhere, anywhere with that thing. Long-range weapon. We talk about all these weapons in Ephesians 6 and 2, but prayer, that's my long-range weapon. That's my frag grenade. When my brother Richard's in uh, Michigan, and I'm down here, and he needs something, I can launch that long-range missile up there. Nothing's more comforting in the world when, when I see this. And, and, and if you ever get behind in the, in the group me chats, oh, Lord help you. Man, what's going on? But the thing is, is I'm praying for you, praying for you, praying for you, standing with you, praying for you, praying for you. You're not alone. You're only alone because you believe the lie. You're only alone because you choose to be alone. That's the only reason you're alone. You don't have to be alone. All you got to do is just say, I'm through with it. I'm through being alone. I'm through trying to do this on my own. I'm through with it. So, rewind three Sundays ago when I was down at Peerless Road Church of God of Prophecy. And the pastor... William Lamb said, I want you to ask each other to your left and to your right, are you ready? And my niece, after the second time, 
she was in the choir. She does all kinds of things. She does everything. And on the second time, I looked at her, and, and we were just kind of joking around. And I said, sweetie, are you ready? She goes, I don't know. Thank you, Lord. That she no longer worried about what I thought. She didn't worry about the people to her left and the people to her right, what they thought about her. She looked deep down inside and she said, Lord, what do I need to do to follow you? And he revealed something in her heart. And then she repented of her sins. Jessica went over and prayed with her. And then we all hugged as a family because she came home that day. But the problem was we didn't even know she was lost. But it's just that simple. But we make it more complicated than it has to be. Let me not go lay down myself because I'm a pastor. Let me not go lay down myself because I'm a bishop. Let me not go lay down myself because I'm a deacon. Those titles mean nothing. It means nothing. Who are you here? Kimberly posted something on uh, Facebook this week. Uh, that, don't call me pastor. Don't call me uh, blah, 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 blah. I don't remember all the stuff. Call me servant. I want to serve you, Lord. Is that your heart today? Is that where you need to be? As Brother Ricky told me this morning, here you are, brother. He told me, he said, we want Jesus to come to the house, but we don't want to show him our nasty rooms. <laughs> you know, It's like when somebody says, hey, uh, can I come over today, Jessica? And Richard and Jessica go, yeah, come on over. And then they run to the house. we got to get this thing cleaned up. Throw everything in this room. Close the door. Don't tell me you ain't never been there, dog. And then you keep them all out in the living room. Look how clean we are, right? But you don't want to see them that, you don't want people to see that nasty bedroom back there. That's where Miss Sarita keeps all Pastor Jerry's junk in this bed. <laughs> so Jesus, come on in the house, but don't go past the living room. Don't go into those dirty bedrooms. Don't go downstairs in the basement where I, where I hide stuff. That's where I hide stuff from Jessica. Jessica told me one time, she said, why don't we have three tree strands? Tree, three tree stands. I don't know. Why not? She said, we'll get rid of them. Okay. So we put them all in the garage. She don't pay attention when she backs out of the garage. For two years, those tree stands were sitting where? In the garage. One time she asked me, she goes, how did we get all these rifles? <laughs> it's down in the basement. That's where we keep stuff we don't want people to see. Down in the basement. But I'm asking you today, just like I had to do all this week, I had to lay some stuff down in my basement, Dale, because there was some nasty stuff down there. There was a lot more repentance that needed to happen in my life. And when I, when I cried out and I said, Lord, reveal it to me, he revealed some things to me. And it wasn't comfortable. I didn't like it. But it was a necessity for me to continue to grow. Because I don't care. I don't care if people see me up here on my face. And I don't care if people see me crying. That's, I, don't, I don't care about that. I only care about one thing. Well done. That's it. Well done. That's it. So as the worship team prays, the other elders will be up here. If you need to come lay some stuff down, if you just need to come up here on your own, that's fine. If you need to sit in your seat, that's fine. The Lord can get you back there just like he can get you right here. I used to tell people there ain't no magic line that if you if you don't pass this line, the Lord's not gonna, the Holy Spirit's not gonna come over you. He'll grab you out in the parking lot on the way in. A.W. Tozer, in this book we're reading, he talks about his mother-in-law or his future mother-in-law that was praying over him. He didn't receive the Holy Spirit at that time. He received it later. It don't matter where you're at. All that matters is, is at that time, do you want it? Do you want to receive it? So as the worship team plays, or plays and prays, come on if you need to come. The day of salvation is today. There is no tomorrow. There is no next week. There is no 10 seconds from now. There's no 30 seconds from now. When you die and you go and you stand before the great right throne, you're not going to be able to say, well, the reason why I didn't lay down my life is because I was afraid of what Karen would think about me in church. I was afraid about what Dale would think about me and my theologies. You're not going to be able to say that. 
you're going to be held accountable. You're going to be able to held accountable. And when that verdict comes back, because we've all watched Law and Order, I think, a couple times, and you hear, guilty, guilty. And then they say, why are you pardoned? There's only going to be able to one thing that you're going to be able to say, and what's that? Jesus. And then two things are going to happen. Either he's going to say, well done, or he's going to say, I never knew you. So this is your opportunity.